I'm Katie Hatch. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. My Seed of Story started in 2015. Um, I'm, I currently am going through another C. diff infection. Um, it seems to be, for me, the song that never ends. Getting care for Catherine has been a lot more complicated due to the COVID situation. Um, at this time, uh, to our knowledge, they're only doing the uh, fecal matter transplant for patients that are in hospital. Uh, now, uh, Catherine's been able to get uh, outpatient treatment, including fluids, uh, multiple times a month from her, uh, her just primary care physician. And this has kept her out of the emergency room, which is great, but in the contrast is we haven't been able to access the FMT. One of the big points of advocacy that Catherine's been working on lately is trying to set new guidelines into place in Utah hospitals that would allow for a patient uh, to provide uh, someone to provide a donor sample. Uh, and that would allow a lot more access to FMTs while still providing the uh, testing you know, that needs to happen for it. Local stool banks in hospitals so that it's not trying to access care from somewhere else. It's, it's always there if you need it. This time has been much more intense. I don't know um, exactly what toxins I have and <laughs> have been infected with this time, but it has been very intense. I've been so worried about you know your health and your energy and everything through this, um, you know, but just seeing how hard it is for for you to to do you know your normal things and. And the amount of effort you put in, um, you know, is both inspiring but also heartbreaking. Kids pick up tension, they pick up pain, they know when their mom isn't feeling well, especially when their mom is just vomiting in the bathroom all the time. <laughs> uh, mom, are you sick? <laughs> Get that a lot. It's okay, buddy, I'm okay. I was really motivated to become a Peggy Lillis Foundation advocate because I saw the work that they were doing. And I think working with uh, PLF has really empowered us to tell Catherine's story in such a way that it's compelling, but also to show why a change is needed. Increasing budget for the CDC, making it a reportable disease. These are the changes that we need to do. And ultimately that translated into action. It's the constant looking forward. There's always goals in PLF and there's always motivation. I think that I'm just grateful that not only am I an advocate for the Peggy Lillis Foundation, but they advocate for me. All right, well, welcome back, everybody, uh, to the second part of our first uh, day of our 2021 CDF Advocate Summit. Um, so I'm really, really excited uh, to introduce you all to our next presenter. Uh, Greg Gonzalez is somebody who I've admired for a long time as an activist and an intellectual. Um, I actually first met Greg a few years ago at a Consumers Union uh, Safe Patient Summit where he gave a presentation that just blew my socks off. Um, and ever since then, I've wanted to have him come and speak to our summit. And uh, this year, it finally is happening. So, um, so <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about Greg. Uh, he's an expert in public policy modeling on infectious disease and substance use, as well as the intersection of public policy and health equity. His research focuses on the use of quantitative models for improving the response to epidemic diseases. He's an associate professor of the Yale School of Public Health and an adjunct professor at the Yale School of Law. Um, for more than 30 years, Greg has worked on HIV AIDS and other global health issues with several organizations, including the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, the Treatment Action Group, Gay Men's Health Crisis, and the AIDS and Rights Alliance for South Africa. He's also a fellow at the Open Society Foundations and the Department of Global Health and School of Medicine at 
sorry, he was also a fellow at the Open Society Foundations and in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School from 2011 to 2012. He is a 2011 graduate of Yale College and received his PhD from Yale Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, School of Public Health in 2017. He is a 2018 MacArthur Fellow. Um, I would say, Greg, that your writing on the COVID-19 pandemic has been one of my guiding lights throughout it. Uh, you're just such a powerful voice. Um, and for those of you who don't follow him on Twitter, you can be assured that he has a mean Twitter feed and it is really worth following him. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being with us, Greg, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey everybody, so I'm gonna give you a, a sort of guided tour through sort of um, the journey of my life um, from um, meeting somebody who was HIV positive when I was in my 20s and never knowing somebody with HIV before um, and where it led me in a search for information, for action, for treatment, um, and all the way to the present through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm gonna leave a lot of time for questions because that's frankly more interesting to me to get into a conversation with all of you. Um, so let's move ahead. So, um, you know, if you come to a school of public health, um, you learn quickly that health is not just about pills into bodies, right? It's not just about medicines. We have something that we call the social determinants of health. And whether it's your age, sex, or gender, um, your social community networks, your living and working conditions, or generally the social and economic environment, cultural environment around you, um, these are all things that promote uh, or, or, or work against uh, our, our health and wellness uh, and happiness in, in, in the context of the broader vision of public health I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, Okay, so it's not a new idea at all. Um, there's a, a couple of seminal pieces of work, one called The Conditions of the Working Class in England by Friedrich Engels, which you may know for other reasons, um, who wrote about the working conditions in the factories in Manchester at the sort of uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, um, but also a piece by a doctor named Carl Virchow, who was looking at a typhus epidemic in Upper Silesia, um, who, saw that people live in working conditions that make them sick. And he said um, in this report on cholera, he, he saw um, something that he, he was one of the first people to remark upon in the context of public health, uh, is sort of the, the differences in who got sick from typhus uh, in 1848 and the epidemics that, that happened in the subsequent years. And he said something that is important to, to us as we think about um, uh, infections and inequalities, is that medical statistics will be our standard of measurement. We will weigh life for life and see where the dead lie thicker, among the workers or among the privileged. Um, so think about that as we think about C. diff and we think about HIV and we think about TB and all the diseases I'm going to talk about today. You know, but determinants are not destiny, right? And, you know, one of the things I learned, you know, in being an ACT UP is that we are not powerless to determine our own lives. This is Joseph June, who is a patient of um, Paul Farmer's at Harvard um, in Haiti, um, dying of AIDS um, back in the early 2000s. This is Joseph after he had access to antiviral therapy, which was not a given uh, outside of the US in the years between 1996 and 2000, 2001. Most people um, who had HIV around the world died of AIDS because antiretroviral therapies were not available to them. They were a uh, privilege of the rich and the middle class in wealthy nations. Um, and this is a, a theme that I think um, will, will, will reoccur throughout this discussion today. So um, in the 90s, there was a play called Angels in America by Tony Kushner, which was really a sort of meditation on what it means to live in America in the late 20th century. And it's a story of somebody living with HIV and his family and his friends uh, in New York. And at the end of the play, they're around the Bethesda Fountain in Central Park. And the, the story of the angel Bethesda is that where the angel Bethesda set, set, set her foot down in Jerusalem, a, a, a well rose up of, of waters that healed people, right? And that's, that's um, the angel of the angels in America and the angel Bethesda from, from the Old Testament. Um, but at the end, they're around the fountain and uh, Prior Walter, who's the main character, says, you know, this disease will be the end of many of us, but not nearly all. And the dead will be commemorated and will struggle on with the living. And we are not going away. We won't die secret deaths anymore. The world only spins forward. We will be citizens. The time has come. 
Who Will Be Citizens is the title of this talk, and it's really about how people who are living with HIV or other diseases um, can really um, think about themselves as citizen patients, as citizen activists, um, in, in, in a more um, active role than, than we might have been thought about pre-HIV or pre-women's health movement. So we need to talk a little bit about history before we talk about the HIV epidemic and, and how it shaped you know, my young life. Um, you know, <laughs> these words were written you know, over 10 years ago and they have a, a remarkable resonance in the world we live in today. But Tony Judd died of ALS. Um, it's actually another set of patient groups that I work with. Um, and he wrote something just before he died, a book written to, to young people around the world called Ill Fares the Land. And he said, you know, something is profoundly wrong with the way we live today. For 30 years, we've made a virtue out of the pursuit of material self-interest. This is now what constitutes remains of our sense of collective purpose. We know what things cost, but we don't know what they're worth. We don't ask if is a judicial ruling or a legislative act is it good, is it fair, is it just, is it right? Um, you know, he, um, claims, and he's a historian of, 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 of post-war Europe, that these used to be the political questions we asked. Is it fair? Is it just? Is it right? We will help bring about a better society or a better world. And he says we need to learn to pose them once again. And this was a challenge to young people in, in Tony's last book uh, that he wrote shortly before he died. So if we're talking about um, the 60s and 70s, um, you know, we see a pivot um, in American political life from the era of the Great Society programs, the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, the last flash of progressivism before we, we reach, um, uh, before we reach the, the sort of modern world that defines my life. Um, and that's the age of Reagan. It's the age of um, Thatcher in the UK, but it's, it's a much more dog eat dog, a sturdy minded, uh, a sturdy ravaged idea of politics. And if you don't know what the AIDS epidemic was like in the early days, some of these early pictures from David Kirby are, are quite shocking. Um, but these are the scenes and deathbed scenes we saw again and again um, as we went to funerals for friends, you know, sometimes several, more than several in a week during the, the 80s and the 90s. Um, and Vito Russo was a film historian who gave this speech in an act of demo in 1988. And he said, you know, living like AIDS is like living through a war which is happening only for those people who happen to be in the trenches. Every time a shell explodes, you look around and you discover that you've lost more of your friends, but nobody else notices. It's not happening to them. Um, only you can hear the screams of the people who are dying and their cries for help. Nobody seems to be noticing. This is what it was like to live with HIV uh, in the 80s and 90s, um, when we had a, a government that really didn't care if we lived or died. Um, the, we were disposable people, as my, uh, my late colleague Larry Kramer once said um, on 60 Minutes back then. Um, but I, I think something remarkable happened, and it has its roots in the, in the women's health movement, the civil rights movement, the gay liberation movement. But a new group uh, arrived on the world stage, and its job was to fight for the rights of people living with HIV. And I think we transformed uh, health and medicine. Uh, about how we think about being patients in the context of, of the world of healthcare and, and biomedical science. And this was ACT UP. Um, you know, I, as Christian said, I got my PhD a few years ago, but where I learned um, most about uh, what the world is like it was through the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, and I think what's important to mention here is that we reconceived health as a political issue and recognized that there were not only social determinants of health, but political determinants of health. Um, I talked to you about that sort of map of the sort of levels of social determinants of health. But in the end, we create, we, we create policies that make us well or make us sick. Um, and the AIDS epidemic was an example of death by public policy. These are some of the sort of uh, posters and iconography of that era. Um, we used media, we used the arts in a way to get our message across in the pre-internet days. So many of these posters were all over, we pasted all over um, sides of buildings and, and on lampposts around New York City, around uh, San Francisco, LA, Boston, and other places, even across the world to, to places with active chapters like Active Paris, et cetera. This is from a street scene in East Village. You've got blood on your hands, Ed Koch. Ed Koch used to ask, hey, how am I doing as the mayor? Um, but uh, he, he really sat on his hands 
uh, when the AIDS epidemic exploded and the city of New York really didn't do much for people with AIDS until he was held to account. You can see we were pretty clear about who we thought was responsible for our fate, um, or at least um, was standing between us and, and and better health and and survival from HIV. Um, we called this, you know, AIDS gate. Um, and Ronald Reagan didn't say the word HIV until seven years into his his presidency. Um, there are posters like this now that are called COVID gate with another president's photo that you might think of. Um, but the 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 Modus operandi is the same. Certain people matter, certain people don't matter. Some people are disposable, some people are left to die. If we were not direct enough with AIDSgate, this is a poster by Donald Moffat. Um, again, pretty clear about who we thought was at the heart of social determinants of political determinants of health in the 80s uh, uh, in the United States at the start of the AIDS epidemic. Again, just more examples of how we used art and graphic design to, to get our message across. And these were placed all over the place uh, in, in New York City and other places that had ACT UP chapters. I think this sums it up a bit um, in terms of who's disposable in the context of HIV. This was um, a poster from 1989 on Independence Day. and. It says, our government continues to ignore the lives, deaths, and suffering of people with HIV infection because they're gay, black, Hispanic, or poor. Um, but the end is, take direct action now, fight back, fight AIDS. So if we think about who's disposable, why people die and suffer, um, it's not just because they have uh, an infection or they have uh, a virus or they have a bacterial infection. Um, there's many other things that, that uh, you can depend on to make you sick or make you well. Um, so we didn't just do lovely, amazing graphic design. I think we revolutionized research and drug development. We opened up experimental access to drugs um, through the parallel track, which were sort of gigantic expanded access programs. I was talking to some friends who were on ALS recently. The DDI and D4T expanded access programs were parallel tracks at 30,000 patients and then before the drugs were approved by the FDA. Um, we also developed uh, uh, new kinds of protocols for the FDA, including accelerated approval, where you could get drugs approved um, on the basis of surrogate markers before um, the clinical data was in. Um, just a side note, um, be careful what you ask for, because um, the confirmatory clinical studies were always about the check being in the mail, that drug companies would do it later. Um, what we've learned 20 years later is that, that we have a situation where we know less and less about the drugs we put in our bodies. They get approved faster and faster, and they cost more and more. So. Some of this early um, pioneering work that we did at ACT UP had unintended consequences. But we also investigated the NIH and drug companies' research portfolios. Um, we Every year we put out a national AIDS treatment agenda um, with all these sorts of policy proposals. The Counting 18 Month Plan was an uh, uh, important piece of our work because what we did was in the years before antiretroviral therapy, which saved all our lives, um, it was the opportunistic infections that killed people. And we said, you could, in 18 months, have a way to better treat and prevent many of the opportunistic infections that killed people with AIDS. And we pulled the NIH to the table, we pulled drug companies to the table, uh, and pushed this work ahead um, starting in the early 1990s. But we did things like um, pressured drug companies in clinical research and trial design. Um, we were deeply involved in the NIH clinical trials group and the other clinical trials platforms run by the NIH. We did our own community-based research. Here, um, you see somebody taking a dose of aerosolized pentamidine against uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, um, uh, a therapy which was known to, to, to treat this disease in the context of transplants, but the NIH wasn't interested in researching it, so the Community Research Initiative on AIDS in New York did this work early on. Um, and it wasn't just in the context of biomedical research and drug development that we were important as ACT UP. We invented safer sex. My old doctor, Joseph Sonneman, who just passed away this year, um, wrote a pamphlet with his patient, Richard Berkowitz, who is still alive, called How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, One Approach. So if you have uh, thought of condoms as an, an STI or an AIDS prophylactic, you can thank Joe and, and Richard for, for pioneering this work. But we invented needle exchange, right? Needle exchange, 
um, is a key way to prevent transmission of HIV infection from one person to another via injection drug use. Um, we're still having these battles. Last week, West Virginia essentially banned needle exchange in the midst of an outbreak uh, across the state of uh, injection drug use associated HIV infection. So we have invented needle exchange 30 years ago, but we're still fighting for it all these years later. And then importantly, um, these are the Ray brothers who were bombed out of their house uh, in, in Florida and subject to lots of discrimination. They're uh, brothers with hemophilia and um, the kind of discrimination that they faced and Ryan White faced who was forced out of school um, in Indiana um, meant that we had to figure out how to make laws to protect people from discrimination. And so a lot of the work we did early on was to protect people um, with HIV from discrimination in housing and education, et cetera, um, which wasn't a, a certainty in the years before the AIDS epidemic. And we started uh, moving on these issues across the board. Um, but none of it really came easily, right? You know, for all the um, you know novel policy work we did, the sort of um, difficult research we did on things we weren't really um, trained to do on trial design, on the immunology of HIV infection, the opportunistic infections that cause death in people with AIDS. We did a lot of sort of technical analytical work um, on our own, self-taught most cases, but we also really um, held the feet, held the agency's feet to the fire who had the, the most effect on our lives. Um, you can see down here um, is our protest called Storm the NIH. Um, you can't do this anymore, <laughs> mostly because of us and 9-11. Um, but you know, now the NIH is surrounded by a big fence, but then you can bring you know, 5,000 people onto the lawn in front of building one at NIH to protest. Dead from drug profiteers, poisoned from ACT, dead from greed, dying on ACT. Um, the first drug to treat HIV infection, which was not very effective, but had well, well substantiated toxicities. Here's the FDA demos, um, where we first push FDA to, to um, take on the parallel track. To, to initiate accelerated approval. And this is the painter, artist, David Wojnarowicz, um, who died of AIDS uh, with his jacket that says, if I die of AIDS, forget burial, just drop my body in the steps of the FDA. Um, again, I think, you know, all these years later, I have lots of thoughts about what parts of these strategies were useful and what were not useful. Um, but um, let's move on and, and, and we can talk about that maybe during the Q&A. Again, the political determinants of health. You know, this is a, a, a doorstop of a book called Why Nations Fail by two economists in Boston at MIT and Harvard. And I was reading it when it came out several years ago, and there's a passage in it that says, those who have power make choices that create poverty. They get it wrong, not by mistake or ignorance, but on purpose, right? And they're talking about why nations prosper and succeed way back into history, like, you know, prehistoric times. And they were truly, not prehistoric times, but basically, you know, BC, we're talking about ancient Egypt, ancient, ancient Assyria. And, and what they say is basically um, predatory elites um, pull power and resources to themselves. Uh, and they do it on purpose, not as an accident. And as I thought about that, and I thought about health, I thought, you know, many people make policies on health, full knowing well what it's gonna do to our bodies, what it's gonna do to our, our lives and our fate. Um, the last time I got arrested was on the floor in the gallery, Senate gallery in the U.S. Capitol when Mitch McConnell was about to move a bill to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, they knew exactly what they were doing when they were about to do that. Um, and we stood up and we got arrested and that bill failed uh, on a vote when John McCain refused to support it. But again, this is all purposeful, right? It's death by public policy, as I mentioned before. Um, in the context of COVID, this has an enormous sort of emotional impact on me because I think today's struggles have a root in our history. They're buried in our geography, playing out across real bodies where old battles spring up anew in other forms. So this is a map of the um, slave states, um, the southern states around the time of the Civil War, looking at density of, of, of African Americans in those days. And you can see the black belt uh, in the in the darker counties, which were huge plantations uh, where, 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 where slaves were forced to, 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 to farm cotton. Um, but if you look at the life expectancy in the US, you know, just a few years ago, the same um, shading of the map of slave states and density of slaves still plays out here 
on the map in, in a life expectancy that is far less than, than the counterparts in other parts of the United States, as you can see in blue. So all these sort of um, political determinants are, have been playing out across our bodies for, for, for decades, for centuries in the United States. Um, and um, they're, they, again, the choices we made are not by accident or by ignorance. They're often made on purpose. Um, if you look at COVID, uh, this is early on in, in the COVID epidemic from last summer, but you can see counties in the black are all sort of more per capita basis from COVID than, than other counties in one state uh, that we're talking about here in Alabama. So the program I run at Yale is called the Global Health Justice Partnership, and we try to practicum where we try to put students on different projects that are focused on um, thinking about how policies make people sick um, and putting them together with community-based organizations around the world to think of um, how we might address these um, um, crises in social justice and crises in public health. These are just some of the projects we've done with the Global Health Justice Practicum um, on maternal mortality and racial disparity in Georgia, on drug pricing that we did with the National Physicians Alliance. Um, this is peace, peacekeeping with, with accountability, without accountability. Um, when the United States and United Nations peacekeepers brought cholera to Haiti and refused to, to, to admit to the fact. This was about um, the quarantines of healthcare workers coming back from West Africa during the Ebola epidemic in 2014-15, um, which was not an epidemic in the United States, um, but was an epidemic of fear um, that we had to confront and we did this with the ACLU. We did, as I said, some work on drug pricing and our first report and first piece of work was on tuberculosis and compensation for uh, occupationally acquired TB and silicosis on the mines in South Africa, in which men basically get sick from TB and silicosis and then the, the South African government and the South African mining industry turns them away without a, without a cent uh, for them to live their lives. Um, in fact, white miners in the pre-apartheid, in the apartheid era had a compensation fund, um, but there's no compensation fund for black South Africans. Um, I'm not going to talk a, a lot about COVID, but um, my colleague Amy Kipchinski and I wrote a series of essays for the Boston Review this spring, last spring, almost a year ago, um, uh, called The Politics of Care, and the Boston Review liked them so much. <laughs> that they took all their essays from basically 2020 that were about Black Lives Matter and about COVID and put them into a book, which they call The Politics of Care, which is the title of our essay. Um, but the, the, the implication of what we wrote back then is that, as I said, these forces have been playing out across bodies for, for decades in the United States. And that map of the slave states and, the, and um, life expectancy in the US those are slides I've had in my uh, possession and, and I've used for years. But it, if there's anything clear about the past 12 to 16 months is that these disparities in healthcare, care, um, which have played out for generations and, and, and probably centuries in the U.S., um, have come back uh, with a vengeance in COVID-19. We all know this, the figures. Um, we all know the disproportionate um, toll of death among African American communities, Latinx communities. We also know that who's getting vaccinated also is inequitable uh, with with uh, African Americans and Latinx populations um, far less likely to get vac vaccinated even now than their 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 European American peers. So remember, we'd offer a chow, right? Medical statistics will be our standard of measurement. We weigh life for life and see where the dead lie thicker among the workers or among the privileged. You know, this is my second epidemic, right? I was around to see the worst days of the AIDS epidemic and to see us move forward um, through successful treatment for HIV in 1996 in the US and then in 2000, um, it being scaled up around uh, the world so that millions of people now around the world have access to antiviral therapy um, because people acted up, because people stood up for their rights and said, we will be citizens, the time has come. Um, one last thing, uh, teaching a course now called Political Epidemiology, because I think we need to really formulate these ideas in the context of research, right? Um, it's okay to, 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 you know, to be an activist and say, you know, we think this is the case, that um, 
public policies make you sick. What I'm trying to teach students in my class right now is to take a policy like immigration or education or, or fiscal or environmental policy and figure out if we can pin the tail on the donkey basically and use uh, experimental and quasi-experimental techniques to basically show that um, um, public policies can make us sick and this is how they do it and this is how we can estimate their effect on real lives uh, with, with, with scientific uh, inquiry and investigation. Um, let's talk together now but if you want to reach me you can write to me here you can email me you can call me um, I'm pretty responsive on email um, phone not so much um, but let's talk about um, what you thought of this talk if you want me to elaborate on other issues I'm happy to do so thanks <clears throat> Greg thank you so much that's uh, almost exactly as <laughs> As I remembered it, though, with the obviously the addition of uh, both of us living through a second uh, pandemic. Um, so uh, I often talk when I talk about C. diff that, you know, I came out uh, in New York City as a gay man in 1989 into the world that you uh, and so many others were fighting to make safe uh, for other men like me and then eventually for you know, the larger public. Um, so something that I think about because unlike HIV, um, the disease that we work on, C. diff, has a particular profile where it, you know, it, it doesn't, or I'm sorry, it doesn't have a particular profile. It kind of is an equal opportunity offender. And so um, what do you think about, or, or how do you think that we can organized sort of across our different races and classes and genders like do you have any uh suggestions for those of us who you know are working on an equal opportunity offender and really want to um reach out beyond our immediate circle so one is i would um bet that people who have c diff whether they get access to treatment or not or they get access to help is not across the board um uh, it, it, it's not an equal opportunity offender. In fact, your access to healthcare is going to determine what happens to you with C. diff, right? So that being said, is one is to think about how you can address the sort of disparities in um, options for people based on race, class, ethnicity in terms of C. diff. Um, but I don't think you have to have a, a recognizable constituency in terms of like the gay community for HIV, for instance, to do this work. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with ALS. Um, patients and people living with ALS. I'm going to talk with them in about a half an hour uh, on a call with some officials with the federal government. Um, you can do what we did for HIV. It's like know your stuff, right? You know, figure out what your priorities are uh, and don't shy away from, 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 from diving into the science and then take it to, to those who need to hear it. Um, and I don't, I, I'm sure you, you know this just as well as I do. Um, but know your stuff and then hold people's feet to the fire. Know where at NIH you need to go to, where at FDA you need to go to, which drug companies you need to deal with. Um, you know, we did these AIDS treatment agendas um, in the late 80s, early 90s. We were like 20 something, right? We, we didn't know very much. But, you know, one of my professors here at Yale once told me um, uh, after six months of, of really looking into something, you're going to get a pretty good idea of what the main issues are, even if you don't know the fundamental. Um, you know, backbones of, of organic chemistry or, or evolution or biology, you'll get the, the large issues and you know what the issues are. Um, the, the main thing is, uh, in retrospect, what I've learned is that you, you need an inside and an outside strategy. Um, it's not okay just to sort of think that, you know, meeting with your members of Congress or writing letters is going to be useful. Um, the fear of God is a little bit necessary to get politicians <laughs> to do the right thing, right? You know, the reason many of us um, went to the U.S. Senate gallery several years ago to get arrested is because we couldn't depend on our members of Congress to do the right thing. And it wasn't just AIDS activists. You know, it was a pretty broad group of people, lots of actually people of faith from churches, synagogues, and mosques around the world, healthcare workers who had come to D.C. for, for, for this um, protest as well. Um, so organize, organize, organize. Um, get people to, to to be vocal in public and to write, but also don't be afraid of, of being angry and um, um, using your emotions in a in a tactical way 
to, to put people on the spot, to say that this is not another meeting with another group of constituents to do this or that, or, oh, I'm a drug company now, you know, why should I meet with you? You know, you, you're a consumer of my product, I don't care. Um, the point is, don't take no for an answer. I think that's one of the lessons we learned. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I mean, I agree with all of that. Uh, you know, I mean, I take a lot of inspiration from, uh, you know, from the HIV AIDS movement and from the women's health movement and the work that we're doing. And, you know, uh, the world has changed because you had these amazing protests at the FDA uh, back in the 80s. And I recently went uh, two years ago to meet with people at the FDA and I took out my iPhone to take a picture of myself and the people I was with. And they said, you can't use your iPhone in here. You can't take pictures inside this facility anymore. And I thought to myself, that's a <laughs> that's a big change, uh, and I do agree that a lot of it is um, partially act up. But I think bigger is the sort of nine eleven, you know, ultra security yeah. uh, mentality, which you know people think makes them safer, but I think it just makes it harder to hold our officials accountable. Um, so we have a question uh, from Helen, and she says, um, you say that getting rid of the ACA was on purpose and they knew exactly what they were doing. What is their end game? So, you know, before COVID, I was sort of like, it, this couldn't possibly be their end game, right? Um, but the end game is this, right? 600,000 people died last, for the past few months, right? more than all wars combined or, or close to all wars combined in the US. Um, the point is, you know, we've had sort of uh, an ideological revolution in the United States starting in the 1980s where the state doesn't really have a role in Americans' lives, right? Um, uh, Grover Norquist, who used to run a club for growth or maybe still does, says, I'm not against government. I just want to make it small enough so you can drown it in the bathtub. I mean, really? You know, are you laughing now, Grover Norquist, after 600,000 people have died because we had a weak healthcare system, a weak public health infrastructure that left us vulnerable and alone against the virus? So I think basically the idea is that people who need healthcare can afford to buy it. And those who can't don't matter. We've had a private healthcare system in the United States where countries around the world have moved away from that you know, some some over 100 years ago. And so the end game is that the state doesn't have a role in our lives, right? Um, that the market can provide. Um, and that, you know, you know, if you can't afford uh, to buy your health care, to buy your drugs, um, you're shit out of luck, excuse my language, right? You know, and, you know, it's interesting. You know, some of the drugs we put in our bodies cost $700,000 for a year's uh, course for a year. Often we don't know very much about them. You know, there's some drugs for Duchenne's monoxidative dystrophy that got approved a couple of years ago on, on fairly dubious data and FDA officials overruled their advisory committee, et cetera. Um, and one of the sort of creepiest things I heard is that, you know, Janet Woodcock at the FDA said that at that time that, you know, investors need to know that there's a future in, in this disease. And I was like, are you kidding me? You're gonna put a drug on the market that you don't know it works. It's going to cost people hundreds of thousands of dollars because investors need to have confidence. Um, and so I think the end game, Helen, is that they really don't care. You know, remember Melania's jacket? I really don't care. Do you? Um, I think there's a real sense that, um, you know, and it's, you know, you think we'd move on after 300 years, 200 years, but let them eat cake, right? There's no bread, let them eat brioche, let them eat cake. And we're in trouble, right? You know, the interesting thing is happening right now is that, you know, President Biden has put in all these sort of new sort of um, big ticket items for infrastructure, for pandemic relief, for 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 um, home care. And there's a whole debate going on about it's too much. It's too much. Um, it wasn't too much when there was a 2017 tax cut that shoveled money uh, up the food chain to the richest people in the United States who didn't need it. So I think there's a real um, purposeful plan to sort of strip the states for its assets, read why nations fail. Because when you read it, you realize what the game is. And it's gone, it's been perpetuated throughout history and the book is, is incredibly compelling. Um, 
is that predatory elites strip the state for its assets and leave the rest of us in the lurch, and that's what's happening. Yeah, and I mean, <clears throat> I agree with a lot of that. I mean, I think one of the things that um, has gotten some attention during COVID, but I think it hasn't gotten nearly enough attention historically is the degree to which, you know, public monies go into a lot of the developments that ultimately become treatments. And the sort of system to recapture some of that revenue and put it back into the public coffers has been kind of eliminated. Um, and, you know, we saw this among, uh, well, not just gay men, but among people who, who want to engage in safer sex with PrEP, where, you know, the U.S. government owns the patent to PrEP, and yet it's been licensed to this company that until very recently was spent, was costing a fortune, which means that the people most likely, most at risk for HIV couldn't afford the very thing that could save their lives. Um, and I just think that this is something that the media obviously is completely complicit in and never talks about. Um, because I think most Americans have generally have no idea of, of how these systems work. And that's partially why we're trying to sort of unmask it for them. Um, so we have another question uh, from Gerard Honig. Uh, the most innovative and resource intensive biomedical res research is largely skewed towards studying patients with a high degree of healthcare access, biasing real world outcomes of research on C. diff and other issues. But the move towards precision medicine, this can become even more problematic. Do you have thoughts about that? Um, have COVID vaccine trials with diverse participation shown potential for improvement? That's a long question, Gerard. So I feel pretty strongly about the this question. So um, yes, one is clinical trials in general are people who can get access to academic medical centers in many cases. So do not only be biased towards um, high degree of people with, um, who have more resources, they're gonna be urban versus rural. Um, they're going to be people who live in communities that are adjacent to these medical centers. Um, you know, and the goal here is to, to, to make clinical trials more accessible to people. And in the context of HIV, we, sit, we told the NIH, you can't just have the AIDS clinical trials group, which was the fancy bells and whistles, every assay under the sun clinical trials network. You had to do something called the clinical research, the community programs for clinical research on AIDS, which were run through... Um, much more um, grassroots healthcare locations, FHQCs, VA sites, et cetera, with the idea that you, um, by democratizing who can get into clinical health, you can make your results more generalizable and understand what the impact of drugs are, not just in, in sort of um, people who have access to healthcare, but the broader range of Americans. And I think precision medicine, you know, I have very strong feelings about this. The idea that we're going to precision medicine our way out of uh, our, our, our illnesses is, is probably not uh, the, you know, just because you have a genetic target that might be useful as a target for a therapy doesn't mean that a drug doesn't have side effects or untoward effects that you, that you might not see in, in a single person's uh, administration of it. But we're still going to need clinical trials and we're going to still need clinical trials that are generalizable, which means, again, moving patients, moving clinical trials into the community, into pragmatic trials, so that, you know, in our regular healthcare settings, we can enroll people in clinical studies if they're interested in it, um, and make it less of a boutique uh, operation where well-funded NIH researchers are running these out of large academic centers. The COVID vaccine trials, millions of people, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were in the, in, in the trials. Um, were they diverse? They're probably more diverse um, than they might have been, you know, if we're thinking about AIDS trials 30 years ago. But, you know, remember, these were done all over the world. Um, what was interesting is that many of these places are done all over the world in places where people can't get access to the vaccines today. Um, we haven't talked about this, but, um, you know, one of the things I'm most upset about right now is that the U.S. put um, billions of dollars into Moderna and other vaccines. Um, and most of the people who I know and have worked with around the world on access to AIDS drugs in Africa and other places don't have a chance in hell in getting vaccinated in 2021 or 2022. Um, so who's disposable again? Um, who who gets to live and who dies? <clears throat> right, and I think that, you know, so earlier today I, I did a presentation, I talked about 
you know, it's funny because you kind of were talking about similar things that I talked about the disposability of senior citizens and how COVID-19 showed that as a culture, we don't give a shit what happens to senior citizens. I mean, we might care about our grandparents, but like as a system, as a country, the elderly are completely expendable to us. <clears throat> and I think that that then has ripple effects, you know, that eventually will show up even in those of us who are more well-resourced than others. Um, so uh, we have a question from Deepa who says, um, thank you for your insights and perspectives. We don't hear these discussions very often, especially in the industry. Uh, do you see any positive trends from a health policy perspective, uh, a movement towards care at all, or would you say we're on a track to fail as a nation? So I gotta believe we can do better, right? And one of it, the last article that Amy and I, the first article Amy and I wrote for the Boston Review is called Alone Against the Virus. So that's like the pessimistic version <laughs> and the diagnosis that, that Christian sort of described. So many people were disposable and clearly disposable in, in 2020. But the last article we wrote for them was called The New Politics of Care. And the whole idea is that we can, if we want, everybody's like, can we go, when can we go back to normal? Well, normal was not a, a boon to, to many people in the United States. You know, healthcare disparities across the board, as I showed you in the slides about life expectancy, have, 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 have been with us for many, many years. Um, and so we need to move forward together. And I think this is why, you know, talking to people with C. diff, you know, I work with people at ALS, you know, the AIDS movement built bridges with people with hepatitis C and with tuberculosis, is that, you know, one thing that should unite us is that they don't care if we live or die. They really don't. Mitch McConnell could, could, couldn't give a crap about whether we live or die. There are plenty of people who who really would like to take more healthcare away from you, who would like to cut this budget and that budget, um, because that's really not the role of the, the federal government. So I think the idea is that we need to sort of build a new movement towards a new politics of care. Um, young people, I think, are going to be at the, the forefront of this. I think um, whether it's the Green New Deal or Black Lives Matter, I think people are, are calling the question, saying, is this the kind of planet we want to live on? Will we survive on a planet uh, together in a nation um, if, if we don't sort of change our ways. And so um, this is a bank or break moment. You know, the infrastructure bill and the, and the COVID relief bill are real throwbacks to the New Deal about when we cared about each other. Um, when Tony Judd said the questions were, were is it just will it fail, will it help people? Um, what happens over the next few weeks? Infrastructure, what does that have to do with C. diff or with HIV? It has everything to do with it. Because it's about whether we're going to invest in people, invest in what makes makes our lives easier and better and, and happier, um, or we're going to basically say we can't afford it. And if you if you deserve any happiness happiness in this life, it's what you can purchase on your own. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, so I I went to a few of the the marches, um, more of some of the demonstrations last summer. Uh, We've had some changes here in New York State, uh, possibly because Andrew Cuomo has been under quite <laughs> a lot of scrutiny. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, we've gotten some increased taxes, we've gotten some more spending. We were initially looking at a ton of cuts, um, which we were resisting, obviously. Um, but, I, you know, what I have been surprised about, Greg, and I wonder if it surprises you too, and, and then we'll go to the last question from the audience. Um, is that I haven't seen demonstrations or large scale demonstrations about COVID. You know, the demonstrations last summer, I think the sort of, the sort of um, structure, you know, the sort of like what we were living through fueled those, though there was obviously the clear outrage uh, at George Floyd's death and Breonna Taylor's death, but there was this sort of underline that was kind of like, everyone has been stuck in the house for six months and is just furious. <laughs> in general, um, but I haven't seen, uh, unless I've missed something, sort of people uniting and getting together and saying like, this COVID thing was crazy and we can never let this happen again. Do you have any thoughts on that? So a couple of things. One is, is that, you know, there's a bunch of people who sort of organized, you know, old ACT UP alums, researchers who we used to work with um, that have been pushing for lots of, um, were lots of changes in the context of, of COVID. And a lot of scientists and, and researchers and clinicians have sprung into action and are talking in the general public, uh, writing for the general public, trying to sort of push 
we had a we had a government that went AWOL in 2020. And so a lot of the sort of um, civil society physicians, healthcare workers, patients, and advocates had to 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 fill in the gap. And so I think there was stuff happening. It wasn't street level activism. But you know, the Black Lives Matters protests are interesting to me because defund the police is the the piece of the slogan that everybody hears and everybody fights about. But nobody ever listens to the second half of that phrase, which is, and invest in our communities. Um, if that's what the Black Lives Matter protests were about, that's something I can work with, right? I can work with the defunding police too, but invest in our communities, we can all agree on that. Um, and what's happening right now is a question of whether we're gonna do those investments. Um, and you know, the COVID relief bill or the infrastructure bill is all about pouring money into communities. And the question is whether we're gonna be able to get our, our, our political leaders to do it. Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin from uh, the Democratic Party may throw a wrench into the works, um, which will basically um, foreclose for another generation our chance to take care of some of America's biggest sort of um, physical infrastructure problems. Okay, so last question from the audience. Uh, Lynn McFarlane asks, uh, we are finding that with the COVID vaccine trials, we have expanded our populations into rural areas and minority populations with the use of mobile vaccine units. These have worked well. Perhaps after the pandemic slows, we need to remember this might be a method to move C. diff trials into rural areas, et cetera. Do you think that's a possibility? It's super brilliant. Um, you know, one of the other things Amy and I have called for is a, a community health core. Basically, yeah. to rebuild public health and healthcare, we have to do it from the ground up, right? Um, we've spent decades disinvesting. You know, the, the fact that you have health disparities isn't an accident. It's systematic and disinvestment in communities over decades, right, and maybe centuries. So if we're gonna rebuild healthcare from the ground up, we have to do it by putting people on the ground in communities, from those communities to help them get their diabetes medications, get a mammography. Um, it also goes up for C. diff and clinical, tri clinical trials and you know, how many people you know have C diff but don't know it or don't know what to do with it in a in a community that you know where where it's very fine hard to find uh, a regular healthcare provider, let alone a, a specialist in infectious diseases. So Lynn's um, instinct that you know mo go to where the people are rather than asking people to come to you is is really what we need to think about if we're going to democratize healthcare, clinical trials, clinical medicine, and healthcare. We have to build. We have to go where the people are not expect them to come to the fancy medical centers to, to get what they need. Um, absolutely, and then to that I would say, um, you know, I, uh, and I think people are having this experience all over New York and possibly in other places in the country, but I got my COVID-19 vaccine at Medgar Evers College at a FEMA run site, and it ran more smoothly than, with all due respect to my great personal physician than his office does. We were in and out. Uh, it was like, you know, in the best use of the terms, military precision and how quickly they got people in and out. And, you know, we only have ha ended up with Javits and Medgar Evers because people were like, we want the vaccine now, now. You know, people were like going on Twitter, calling their Congress people, like they were not willing to wait until we could get them into every Walgreens and wait you know, two months for an appointment. So I think that was a good sign. Um, and I hope that it's a sign for the future because I've been frustrated by the fact that like, we have a lot of elderly people in, Amer in New York City who are not vaccinated yet yep. because they can't get to the facility. So what we need are people who are going to go and vaccinate those people in their houses. Yep. Um, and as you know, we have lots of unemployed people right now who could do that work with some, you know, with a few weeks training. Um, so we have to leave it there because we're almost out of time. Uh, Greg, I appreciate you so much for taking the time. I know you're very, very busy, never in the last, the last <laughs> year or so. Um, and, you know, you inspire me with your work uh, and hopefully you've inspired a bunch of our advocates. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Take care. <clears throat> so, um, we are going to have our next session at three o'clock, uh, which gives me a couple of minutes to run to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> while you wait for that, um, we are going to show another video from one of our advocates, Megan Memna, uh, who lost her mom to C. diff a few years back. So uh, watch that and then join us again here on the main stage at 3 p.m. for a conversation about uh, preventing C. diff through antimicrobial stewardship. Thanks. <laughs>
My name is Megan. I'm from Cranston, Rhode Island. Um, in 2012, I lost my mom to a C. diff infection that she contracted. She was only 64 years old, and I had never heard of C. diff um, before uh, that moment in time, um, which I found insane seeing as I'm a college-educated person. That really kind of launched me into finding as much information as I can about it, and that led me to the Peggy Lillis Foundation and becoming an advocate. I've been to quite a few summits. It's definitely helped me be able to speak in public more, to advocate with my legislators, not only speak, but um, really engage. The sense of community that you build through advocacy is really one of the biggest highlights. The foundation has made great strides. You go to a simple Google search engine and type in C. diff and Peggy Lillis Foundation is going to be there with videos, with pamphlets, with any type of resource and one-on-one -on -one communication. You know, they can, you can send an email, you're going to get a response. I think that's one of the the best things that they have been able to create this culture that you're not alone and that you can get answers and assistance um, and basically anything that you would need.